in a lucid dream, you're everything. You know, everything's you. In the lucid dream, if a black dog runs past you, that black dog's you. And in fact, you can actually go to that black dog and say, what do you represent? And it will tell you. In a lucid dream, you can meet your fear. You can literally call out to meet your fear. Uh, God, yeah, when did I start lucid dreaming? Like 16 and I'm 31? That's 16, 15 years? So my name is Charlie Morley and I teach something called Mindfulness of Dream and Sleep, which is a holistic approach to lucid dreaming practice within the context of mindfulness meditation and Tibetan Buddhism. Lucid dreaming for me, apart from anything else, it's really fun. This is, this is one of the reasons probably why you can just keep doing it for so long, it never gets old. To become fully conscious within this huge three-dimensional virtual reality simulation of your own mind will never get old. And that's what a lucid dream is at a very base level. At most, it's an experiential entry into the depths of your psyche. The potential of this is huge. I think once this enters into a therapeutic framework, uh, the lid's gonna really come off this and we're gonna see this as one of the most accessible healing therapeutic modalities available to us. This, this mind we have is brilliant and it can do amazing things, but I think most of us are completely unaware of how brilliant this mind is and what a unique potential it has to know itself and to be fully awakened. I would advise everyone to have some sort of practice that trains the mind and brings us out of these confines and limitations of the self and into an experience of something bigger, that experience of oneness. And for some people that's meditation, other people it's dance, other people it's psychedelics. Um, I would say neither is right nor wrong, but this emergence out of the confines of the self I think is really important for people to have if they can. You know sometimes if you have like a really hectic dream, you can wake up in the morning and you almost feel tired. I mean, it's just psychological tiredness, but you really feel like your brain's been kind of, you know, really active in creating this, uh, this scenario. Well, your brain has been. You know, dreaming is a very active state. In fact, you're not resting during REM dreaming sleep. You rest in deep sleep and elements of light sleep. So you're not resting anyway when you're dreaming. Now, if you become lucid in your dream, the dream actually becomes more restful because you bring mindful awareness into the dream. If we define an aspect of mindfulness as knowing what's happening as it's happening, then a lucid dream isn't just analogous to that, it's actually a direct extension of it, knowing that I'm dreaming as I'm dreaming. So we're already in a state of mindfulness. However hectic the dream is, once you become lucid in it, because you know it's not real, any of those psychological kind of exhaustion factors that would make you feel tired in the morning uh, are quite naturally negated. But on top of that, once you're lucid, you can start doing stuff that boosts your energy. If you go into the lucid dream and meditate within the lucid dream, do qigong, do hands-on reiki, do tai chi within the lucid dream, wow, and the next day you are buzzing like a fridge. I remember when I was 15, I read a book called Sophie's World, and I read it just the time I was doing my um, GCSEs. And in this, it's the story of a young girl receiving uh, philosophical teachings from this other character. And there's a section on Buddhism. Now, I read the book and it was a brilliant book, but the bit that really chimed for me was bu with Buddhism. Around this time, I was also listening to a lot of Wu-Tang Clan, you know, the hip-hop group, who had all these samples from Shaolin Kung Fu movies. Suddenly it seemed like, oh, Wu-Tang Clan think Buddhism's cool. Shaolin Kung Fu, that's cool, that's masculine there, they're you know, good at fighting and stuff. So I think I was aware of it from about 16, but then at 19 I made the commitment and took refuge where you formally become a Buddhist. I've seen some people who've got lucid after a half an hour talk I've given at a music festival. Other people who've got 20 years of Buddhist meditation practice, they come in, it takes them ages, you know, months to have their first lucid dream. Totally, totally depends. Two major factors here though. One is enthusiasm and the other is determined practice. So that enthusiasm that sees the potential of lucid dreaming is the easiest way to get lucid. You know, when I do workshops, I see that guy in the front row and he's like, 
wow, no way, this stuff is blowing my mind. You can go in the dream and heal, you can go in the dream and do your spiritual practice. And I know that night that guy's getting lucid. You can just feel it. his energy is so high, the enthusiasm so so directed towards this, um, this aspiration to have a lucid dream. You know he's going to have it. But the other way is engaging the formulas. There are certain formulas that if you go through the formula with this aspect of enthusiasm, you will have a lucid dream. Um, so I'm yet to find someone who can't lucid dream. Often your first lucid dream goes something like, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming, oh my god, boom, and you wake up. You're imagining that it's going to look like a dream, or it's going to look like an acid trip, or something, every kind of colours flowing, and it is crisp and solid that it can just be too mind-blowing. So imagine an hour walking around or flying around this huge virtual reality simulation of your mind in which the healing work that you do within it permeates the very deepest level of mind, allowing you to work with addictions, phobias, negative thought programming, confidence issues, while you sleep, as well as doing your spiritual practice in bed. My biggest inspirations in life, I think again, probably my teachers. So for me, that teacher-student relationship is really, really important, and I owe everything to my teachers, um, especially my teacher, Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, uh, who was exiled from Tibet, along with his brother, who was a famous Lama called Akon Rinpoche. And, um, you know, their story of escape from Tibet, man, literally, you know, at times there were Chinese shooting at them, and uh, they barely made it to the, to the border. At one point, Lama Yeshe ate his own shoes. They had so little food left and he refused to eat animals. Even when they were starving, they kept their vows of vegetarianism. This story of survival and of not giving up and of keep going and of this beneficial positive energy driving them through, that really inspires me. Uh, and my mum. My mum inspires me too. So within Tibetan Buddhism, it's believed that when you die, you enter an intermediate state, uh, sometimes referred to as the bardo. Now, bardo uh, is usually a word associated with the after-death bardo, the after-death intermediate state, but actually this life is a bardo, because bardo means place between. So this life is a place between birth and death. At the point of death, it's believed we enter another type of bardo, the after-death bardo, this intermediate state between the end of this life and rebirth into the next. So in the same way as when we go to sleep every night and our mind flips inwardly and experiences new realities created by its own projection, at the point of death a similar thing happens but on a larger scale. Now the quality of this bardo is said to be a dreamlike hallucinatory experience. That moment of aha I'm dead, that realization of the nature of mind at the point of death holds the highest spiritual potential potential of full awakening at the point of death. So our lucid dream training is indirectly or very directly, if you're practicing it from a Tibetan Buddhist point of view, training for the moment of death. Now, I don't know whether this stuff works. You know, I have no knowledge of my past life. I have no idea whether all my lucid dream training will actually lead to awareness at the point of death. Who knows? What it does do is completely recalibrate your view of death. I am far less scared of death now than I was before I started doing the lucid dreaming practice. So yeah, lucid dreaming wakes you up to death in a really good way. Not that you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna die, but like, wow, I'm gonna die. This could be the last interview I ever do. So let's try and make this like really, really good. So you can connect with me on Twitter, it's at Charlie Morley One. Uh, on Facebook, Charlie Morley Lucid Dreaming Teacher. My website is www.charliemorley.com. Uh, and I've got these books too, ta-da! If you just want a quick uh, intro to lucid dreaming, something you can keep on your bedside and learn how to lucid dream, then this one. Uh, if you're interested in Tibetan Buddhism, mindfulness meditation, much more thorough guide to mindfulness of dream and sleep, and lucid dreaming on the spiritual path, then Dreams of Awakening is uh, the one for you. Thanks so much.